So I call him so hard, the employees wanna find me And then wanna hire me What's 100k to a guy like me? Could you please remind me? Fall so hard, this ain't easy Working late nights, you best believe me My grades can only go ace Never wanna see another B unless I'm Jay-Z Fall so hard, let's get paid Welcome to Farm So Hard. My name is Dr. Oscar Santalo. I am a pharmacy and operations and compliance coordinator here. I'm here with one of my learners, Super Turns. Uh, Darla, can you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Darla. I'm a pharmacy intern here. Awesome. So today, our episode is on Drug Trends 2019. The article we'll be reviewing uh, was recently published in 2019. Uh, national Trends in Prescription Drug Expenditures and Projections for 2019. Uh, this is by Dr. Schumach and others. We're very excited to go over this article. And Darla, can you hit us with the background info? Yeah, so this article gave the drug expenditure through the 2018 calendar year, and they obtained the data from the IQVIA National Sales Perspectives Database, and they analyzed it. And they found that overall expenditures of pharmaceuticals in the United States grew 5.5% in 2018 compared to the previous year for a total of $476.2 billion. Good points, Darla. Non-federal hospitals accounted for $35.8 billion in prescription expenditures in 2018. Uh, that's about a 4.8% increase from 2017. The reason we also picked this article is because it analyzed the factors that can influence drug spending in hospitals and clinics and provided expenditure projections for 2019 for non federal hospitals, clinics, and overall the other sectors. So why are we even talking about this article? Uh, kind of picking off where we are discussing previous point was what are the factors driving the growth? Uh, some of the highlighted factors are purchases of new products that were not available previously, price changes of existing agents, including both brand and generic drugs, and also changes in the volume of purchases, possibly reflecting the changes in utilization. And also there's a higher growth in expenditures for older generics. Uh, Darla, can you list out some of those reasons? Yeah, so sometimes drug shortages can lead to demand-related price increases or shifts. So we have to use brand products and also uh, product discontinuations due to either manufacturing issues or sometimes business decisions. Guys, I have an amazing super turn. So bringing it back, I'm a Joe Smo pharmacist. I'm listening to this podcast. Like, why are drug trends significant to me? Darla? Do you mind chiming in a little bit more? So understanding the drug trends can help pharmacies stay up to date on where the industry is heading. So we can use the drug trends to predict pharmacy drug expenditure and budget based on the current trend data. All right. Very good. Very good. Now the moment everyone was waiting for. Let's talk about these drugs. Uh, just listing out just the top five. Uh, rituximab immune globulin, all to place. Darla, would you like to list a few? Yeah, so infliximab, natalizumab, nivolumab, <laughs> trastuzumab, and bevacizumab, and then pneumococcal vaccine. Of course, I gave the intern all the tongue twisters. <laughs> Sorry, Darla. <laughs> a lot of oncology drugs in there. And what you kind of notice is a lot of early directed oncology therapy, a lot of push to the outpatient setting. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, just also highlight a couple other drugs that made the list, um, IV acetaminophen, um, erythropoietin alpha with some biosimilars on the way, right? Zosin and vasopressin also made this top 25 list. If there's definitely uh, other drugs that you guys should think on the top 25 list, I would recommend you highly check it out. So what are some other endpoints or takeaways from this? Um, increase in prescription drug expenditures by 30% for home health care. Uh, that's the kind of things we're talking about where we know that receiving expensive medications in the outpatient, definitely much cheaper than receiving an inpatient setting. So an example, you have some hospitals with a lot of initiatives with rituximab, as you see there at the top of the list for hospital expenditures. And that rituximab Total spend was $1.2 billion in expenditure for non-federal hospitals. So kind of transitioning over to other takeaways. 
Uh, the spending on direct acting oral anticoagulants increased a pixaban from 52.6% from baseline last year, 27 or two years ago, 2017, 2018, and river rocks ban increased by 20% by 2018 from 2017. I think this is because not only because of the indications added, I think it's also because insurance companies just overall noticed that like, hey, this is much cheaper than warfarin on top of all their monitoring that goes along with it. So I can see I, this baseline does kind of make sense from 2017 to 2018. Another key point from this article, uh, the authors wrote, among the top 25 drug by expenditures in clinics in 2018, the erythropoiesis stimulating agents, erythropoietin and darpoietin, had reduced spending. Um, this could be like because of the biosimilars that came out. Enemies and biosimilars can affect how hospitals and clinics adjust drug expenditure from year to year. Of 59 NMEs and 7 biosimilars were approved in 2018. Uh, Darla, I said the word NME, abbreviation really, and biosimilar. Can you tell me what these are? Yeah, so an NME is a new molecular entity. These are drugs that have an active moiety that has never been approved by the FDA marketed in the U.S., so an example is Tecterna, which was the first blood pressure medication that gained FDA approval for renin inhibition. And then um, biosimilars are biological products that are highly similar but have no, mean no clinical meaningful differences from the previous approved FDA uh, reference product. Well said, Darla. For those of us that are a little unfamiliar with the biosimilar process, and we're going to have those hard discussion with providers on like, hey, this is why biosimilars would still be appropriate in these situations. Can you just kind of review the process for biosimilars? Yeah, so biosimilar approval is much different than regular generic drug approval. So the data needed is analytical study demonstrate analytical studies demonstrating that the product is highly similar. They also need to have like animal studies for toxicity and clinical studies to prove safety, purity, and potency. And then also an application stating that the product will produ produce the same result as the reference. This differs from generics where it's required to generate the same full profile as the reference product because biosimilar manufacturers don't have to conduct as many like expensive and lengthy trials. They just have to prove that it should work like the reference product. Like if you were the patient and they explained to you what a biosimilar was and that was a cheaper option to kind of work the same, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I would definitely go with the biosimilar. Right. Right? So overall, specialty drug expenditures increased 11.1% in 2018 compared to 2017, a rate faster than the overall market growth rate of 5.5%. With the help of Darla going over biosimilars, um, those analysis this article did, um, approved through November 1st of 2018, indicated that 13 biosimilars had been approved by the FDA, but 7 of the 13 had not been marketed due to patent litigation, patent settlement, or the manufacturer's choice. What the authors in this article did note was that the safety of biosimilars will likely continue to be the focus of incendiary scare tactics such as comparing risk of biosimilars to those of thalidomide uh, by the original companies and their advocacy groups. So we've been talking a lot about biosimilars, but what about specialty drugs? Darla, can you go over how we define specialty drugs? All right, so they have to meet four or more of the following criteria. So they have to be initiated and maintained by specialists, generally injectable and or not self-administered. They require an additional level of care in the chain of custody. The annual cost of therapy is at least $6,000. It requires unique distribution, could require extensive or in-depth monitoring and patient counseling. And then the last one is that it would require reimbursement assistance. So it's three or more? Four or more? Four or more. Four or more? Yeah. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure I knew that. So with specialty drugs or just overall those very expensive medications, you can kind of see that why a pharmacy enterprise would want to have these drugs pushed towards the outpatient setting, just overall try to decrease costs and improve patient compliance um, just to get these patients out of our EDs. Transitioning away from specialty drugs or biosimilars, not really, 
but in terms of therapeutic categories, there was a huge expenditure in neurologic disorders, which was 32.4% from 2017-2018, uh, 18% for immunologic agents, 17.7% from contraceptives, and 12.5% uh, for hormones. As an example for neurologic disorders, glutaramate A, which became available as a generic in late of 2017, remains among the top 25 drugs by expenditures across all markets, with expenditures of 3.4 billion, but a 20.4% reduction compared to 2017, which is a nice segue to patent expirations. Uh, hospitals and clinics must also be aware of drugs that have potential patent expirations each year. This could definitely play a role in your budget. Uh, generic forms of these drugs may be in the pipeline, which are cheaper alternatives to the brand counterparts. Uh, the launch in 2017 of new generic version of drug Civelomir, which is previously in the top 25, resulted in a 77.8 reduction in spending in 2018 compared to 2017. Uh, many observers had anticipated reduced spending on Cineclip because of its generic availability. Instead, it remained in the top 25 drugs by expenditures in 2018, mainly because it just got caught into patent litigation between the generic maker Teva and the brand and product manufacturer Amgen. This dispute has now been settled, but Teva has agreed to stop selling its generic product until its license date in mid-2021. What this article also did was that it had a nice little table of selected drugs with patent expirations. Uh, you guys want to know what one of the drugs are on the list? I find very interesting it is a Pixaban. I don't know if it's going to go generic. <laughs> but it's definitely something like Could be one it. of them. Definitely something to follow, right? So something... In 2017 happened. A certain someone in, in 2017 said something. What happened, Darla? Right. President Trump declared the opioid epidemic as a national public health emergency. So this meant that more money was going to go to this issue, and it's likely to grow in the future. In result to what the president said, he talked about Matt, or the rise of Matt in this article. Can you tell us what it is? Yeah, so MAT stands for Medication Assisted Therapy, and with the opioid crisis going on, a lot of money is going to go, go towards people who have um, opioid use disorder, so this is what that's referring to. Can you give me some examples? Methadone clinic? It would be methadone, naloxone, suboxone, those kind of medications. You'll see updated literature, you'll see CEs on just new initiatives with MAP therapy coming out of the ED, just kind of making sure that patients kind of get discharged with these medications. Phew. So we talked about a bunch today. Uh, Darla, do you mind giving us a quick recap on everything that we discussed? Right. So forecasting drug trends and budgeting can be really important to pharmacy leaders. It's important to pay attention to new drugs coming into the market and um, focusing on initiatives, transitioning infusions from inpatient to outpatient to save money. It's important to pay attention to the rise of biosimilars being approved, um, monitoring initiatives for MAT medications, and also products that are soon to be coming off of patents, but being patient with that process. Phenomenal summary. Great job, Superturn. For most of these Articles that we'll be reviewing from an operational administrator perspective, we'll try to give you guys some limitations, but great thing for this article, it had no limitations. The information was provided to the reader, was in scope and was relevant. There was no biases and the information was provided objectively based on the data received. So in summary, that's all we have for you guys today. Again, I am your host, Dr. Oscar Santalo, and I am here with my intern. Darla Guevero. You can follow me on Twitter at Oscar Santalo. And you can also find Darla on Twitter on there as well. Um, you can also hit us up on LinkedIn and follow us and add us as friends also. You guys have a great day. I hope we provide it with all the drug trends coming your way. And just give us any feedback on the episode. Thank you guys.